to stay. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Boards, a podcast dedicated to the interests and actions of skaters beyond skateboarding. Today's guest, Scott Bourne, is another childhood hero of mine. Scott lived as a pro skater in San Francisco in the late 90s and early 2000s. After traveling for many years for his sponsors, he settled down in Paris, France, where he's currently living with his wife and two kids, working part-time as a model and full-time as a writer. His most recent work, An Act of Imagination, is poetry for children, illustrated by his friend Todd Bradshrod, and was released in 2020. He has a unique and interesting approach to everything he does, whether it is on a skateboard or in front of a typewriter. He has strong opinions about life, politics, modern technology, and is not afraid to express them. Since I started this podcast, I have conducted all of my interviews via Zoom calls, but Scott being located in Paris, he kindly offered to do the interview at his place, and I thank him again for taking the time to chat with me in person. So here's my conversation with the one and only Scott Bourne. I hope you'll enjoy it. Again, thank you very much for uh, <laughs> taking some time to see me. I really appreciate it. And as I said, I'm a huge fan. I, I, I first saw you in The Strongest of the Strange that I saw. I don't remember what year that came out, but maybe mid 2000s maybe 2005 six or seven around there yeah i would say i would um, say yeah early yeah. 2000s yeah, yeah i can't remember now i guess i moved here no it must i think it was later than that because i want to say 2007 we went to eastern europe right i think mongolia was 2004 2005 okay no that video was was really sick when it came out i think i remember the first time i saw it i thought to myself this is a really strange video like i don't understand it It was so different from the standard, you know, skate video that was trick, trick, trick and like a part, part, part. And it actually took me a few times to watch it again and understand that there was, you know, somewhat of an artistic vision to it. Yeah, I mean, that's like, I mean, honestly, for me, that's totally Pontus. He's such oh, a yeah, yeah. creative person. He really, sure. he really went out of his way. And he, yeah. for me, it's not a skate video. He made a film. Yeah, there's, exactly. There's also storytelling. There's a lot of film. There's a lot of... 16 millimeter, yeah. like 8 millimeter. Some personal like photos of him from his, with his family sure. and stuff. And, and, yeah. and personal film from, you know, his, his father's camera reel. And he also handpicked everybody that was in there. He only yeah. picked people that I think that he felt were creative skateboarders. He might sure. not have even liked you. I don't even know if Pontus likes me. Uh -huh. But I think that he felt I was a creative person. Right. And that's, like the way he skated. Yeah, yeah so I think, that, I think that that's what built that video is, is, sure. is Pontus had this idea, but he did put a lot of very creative people in there and let them do what they wanted. We edited that video my video part in like 10 days i went and spent 10 days with him okay and we just skated and edited and drank a lot and <laughs> went to the piano bar it was a great experience but and is that when he was still in sweden yeah he was still in sweden and that's uh it was also brutally cold it was like yeah. you know two foot of snow yeah and we were riding like he had a little motorcycle and i had a um bicycle and i would hold on to his shoulder oh yeah and he'd pull me through town <laughs> to the skate park when we had the boards Right. It was uh, yeah, it was brutal. It was cold, but uh, by far that's like my favorite all time video. Yeah, yeah by far oh, for, for sure. Yeah, for me, uh, for me as well. Yeah, I started skating in 2000, so when I was 13, and I think one of the first videos I saw was like Minik Mali. So that was of course like a very different approach to skateboarding, much more like uh, athletic. Yeah, and basically like skating like perfect spots and, and doing technical tricks and, and uh, an interesting approach to skating, but a very standardized one. And when I saw the song I said was strange a few years later, my first response was just like, what the fuck is this? But then I grew to enjoy it and understand that it, it had much more personality and it had much more depth and much more storytelling behind it. I just enjoyed, especially your part, because it had, you had this way of skating, you know, doing like skating fast and doing like simple tricks so to speak compared to like an Eric Costin or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. but still like it was very impressive and it had this really communicative energy to it that I didn't find in Eric Costin for example uh, yeah well I, I mean it, again it's just a different type of skateboarding oh, yeah. for sure but um, mm -hmm. I, again it's like Pont is just picking out these people that he knew were creative not just yeah. necessarily good skateboarders or good at skateboarding right. putting them in a basket together and shaking it up and seeing what 
would come out, you know, like yeah. for me, it's like the name's perfect too. Strongest of the strange. Like right. these are all kind of misfits in skateboarding. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Pontus right. is like maybe the biggest misfit who's made himself almost like cool to be a misfit. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're definitely not a group of Olympic skateboarders. You know? <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about that too, but let's, let's bring it back a little bit to, uh, you grew growing up. I think I read somewhere you're from North Carolina, right? That's where you grew up. Yep. I'm originally from North Carolina. We moved there. I say originally, I was actually born in Florida. Okay. Lived in Virginia for a little while. And then, uh, we moved to North Carolina. I was still really young. I don't think I was older than like, I don't know, eight years old, maybe at the time. Mm-hmm. But um, that's where, you know, I went to high school, had my first, you know, boyhood friends, like made bonds, picked up a skateboard, you know, and, and got really involved in skateboarding, which believe it or not, even at that time, skateboarding was kind of a big thing in North Carolina. And, really? Well, I mean, well, you had Reggie Barnes, who had Endless Grind Skate Shop. Mm-hmm. He was like pro for Walker, started the skate shop, which grew into Eastern Skateboard Supply. So that brought a lot of a lot of skateboarding industry yeah. and industry people to, to North Carolina. And, yeah. mm-hmm. and I mean, I saw everybody. I saw everybody come through the Endless Grind parking lot. You know, all the teams at the time. You know, we saw Real. We saw the Think guys. I mean, I remember Rodney Mullen came through. Man, I don't even yeah. know who. Like World yeah. Industry guys, New Deal guys. At the same time, you know, you got you got guys like Neil Hendricks. He's from North Carolina. Oh, really? um, Chet Childress, he's from North Carolina. Kenny Hughes, you know, I grew up skating yeah. with all these guys. Isn't you know uh, I mean? Mark Johnson? Mark Johnson, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's, he's from, from North Carolina. Carolina. I wasn't sure if he was from North or South Carolina. Nope. Yeah. North Carolina, mm-hmm. Lenny Kirk's from North Carolina. I mean, yeah. there's so many guys. Yeah. The Dong Brothers, which were phenomenal at the time. Mm-hmm. W.L. Sullivan is from North Carolina. What year did you start skating? Do you remember? Man, I, you know, I really got into it when I was like sixth grade, I think. I was like 12 or 13. I don't even know. I'd had a little fiber flex skateboard even mm-hmm. when I was living in Virginia, which I have vague memories of. And I remember having a hard time letting go of my fiber flex skateboard, even when I got like a real quote unquote real skateboard, like a pro deck. The fiber flex is so fun. Actually, the sponsor me tape that went to uh, Consolidated at some point, which went through Moish Brennan, which was kind of funny because yeah, I was skating with Karma at the time and Jackson and I met Moish. And Moish was the one who was like, you got to make a sponsor me tape. And I was like, I don't really have anything. And I ended up giving him this sponsor me tape. Mm-hmm. And it was mostly me fucking off on a Fiberflex board. Mm-hmm. Jason saw it, Jesse. And he was like, this oh, yeah. is amazing. He loved it and <laughs> wanted to meet. And then like, so basically my sponsor me video was on a Fiberflex skateboard. But uh, yeah, 12, 13 is, is really when I got into it, you know. Mm-hmm. So when did like sponsorship kind of become a thing? And was that... Already in North Carolina, or is that when you moved to San Francisco? Yeah, man, I'll give you the quick one on that. I don't know. Like at that time, I, I was sponsored rather quickly at first by Aussie Island Skate Shop, which was a skate shop in Burlington. Um, I later started riding for Endless Grind, which is out of Raleigh. Then I got flowed boards from this guy Sambo, who used to make boards out of the back of Eastern Skateboard Supply. He had a company called BS Board Sports, and uh, it was actually me, Kenny Hughes. And uh, this other guy named Dave Kelly, which he never okay. went on to the pro level, but it's funny, yeah, Kenny and I used to ride for, but he made the best boards ever, man. They were just, and they were all handmade one at a time. He was just awesome. So mm-hmm. went from that to actually, man, I got flowed from Birdhouse at one point. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Which was, which Birdhouse. was actually through Reggie. It was when it first started. It was a uh, pair Willander or pair Andre was behind it. Somebody, I can't remember. And they came through town and I met them through Reggie. And then they just started flowing me boards. I blew out my knee. So that was the early 90s around there? Or? Yeah, man, I guess I graduated high school in 91. So it was like probably 91, 90s. 92. Okay. okay. And then blew out my knee and then things, I kind of got out of it for a moment. Ended up going to California a few times and I'd met like Jim Thibault and the Deluxe guys, which was all through my buddy um, at the time, Joe Dong, who was from North Carolina, was working at the Deluxe store. Mm-hmm. And then Reggie gave me a reference. I ended up working there for a heartbeat, but they flowed me boards for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, real did. Yeah, just never the, the real thing never really happened for me. And then the guys at Adrenaline, they wanted, do you remember Adrenaline through Think? It was Jaya, bit, yeah. mm-hmm. Jaya and Chris, which were just like, I mean, Chris Sims is so phenomenal. Just someone Jaya, like that. Bon, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just like those guys were just amazing guys. And someone like Chris for me is like, 
was into my skating. It just thr- yeah. thrilled me. You know what I mean? He's such a fantastic yeah, skateboarder. Yeah, he's, he's amazing. Yeah. yeah, he's amazing. And so then I did the adrenaline thing for a little while. And basically that thing f- didn't really fall through. They kind of pulled the plug on it. I don't know. So that everybody left Think. And it was in that period when they left Think. It was before they, they signed up with another company, which was called Good Times at the time. Mm-hmm. Good Times Skateboards. There was a period of time between then where I was just kind of floating around and I was kind of over it. I didn't really care. I was still getting wheels from Spitfire and Thunder and yeah, I don't know. It was yeah, it was just a hard time. It wasn't. I was just kind of disenchanted with skateboarding. Also being there and seeing the industry and meeting a lot of pros and skating the spots and yeah, I had a moment of like I don't even care about this anymore. And then that's when Moish Moish Brennan, who was the artistic director at Consolidated, he was the one that was just like, dude, you gotta make a tape, you gotta make a tape, and then. I mean, the story is basically, I gave him a tape, a few days later, literally my phone rang and it was like the sketchiest voice ever, like, hey, uh, uh, is Scott Born there? And I was like, I was like, yeah, this is him. And he was like, oh, well, uh, yeah, uh, this is Jason Jesse, man, do you want to ride for Consolidated? It was just like that. Wow. And by, you, you know, no one could, no one could imitate Jason's voice, yeah. it was totally Jason. And, and, he, and he was nervous, he's like, oh, this is Jason Jesse, what about for Jason? Like, immediately asked me, I was like, uh... Yeah, I guess. Like, so, yeah. yeah, I was just like, yeah, yeah. really? And he's like, really? You want to ride? Really? I was like, yeah, man, you crazy? What? And then we both became like three year olds on the phone. Like, I was like, he's like, I want to meet you. I was like, I want to meet you. Like, so it was really kind of a kind of like Funny, yeah. dream come true kind of phone call. Like, I remember hanging up the phone and being like, did that just happen? Yeah. yeah. Was that Jason Jesse? Really? Jason Jesse just called me, asked me to ride for his company. You know, like yeah. what? Long story short, you know, I went down there, met Jason. You know. Berto, Leticia, everyone, you know, already knew uh, Moish, you know, but everybody involved and it was just awesome and cool and it happened. Yeah. And boom. It made sense for you at the time. Yeah, it was, I mean, honestly, man, if, if at that time in my life, if I could have picked any sponsor, mm-hmm. and don't get me wrong because it's like the guys at Real were awesome. Right. All the guys at Think and Adrenaline, they were awesome. But just if I could have ridden for anybody at the time, it would have been Black Label or Consolidated. Those are the two yeah. teams that were just for me. I was like, what the fuck, man? These guys are, you know what I mean? Yeah. So just having that call from Jason, I mean, it like mm-hmm. really put me on a pedestal. It really you yeah. know, fueled me and boosted me up, made me feel like it was also like the craziest thing I could ever do because I went from feeling like I was, you know, like it was an okay skateboarder to like, now I'm in the van with Karma Tashev and Alan Peterson, and mm-hmm. these guys are not fucking around. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was another push for me. I was in the van with, for me, two of the greatest guys mm-hmm. of the time. And when I say that, man, those guys can skate anything. They're not just handrail guys. They're not just vert guys. They're not just yeah. bowl guys. They're not just street skaters or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. in the same day, Alan's going to do the biggest transfer from ramp to bowl you've ever seen and then he's going to do a feeble rail down a 20 set handrail right then karma is going to do a kick flip over the biggest box at the demo and then go out and do a three flip tail slide i mean whatever you know what i mean like and just destroy the bowl don't go to burnside with those guys i mean like super diverse i mean yeah i mean hands down those are two of the greatest guys ever and well-rounded and both of them are underdogs no one even knows about them anymore no that's true, yeah, yeah. They kind of uh, disappeared a little bit, yeah. So at, at what point, um, when in all this did you move to San Francisco? Was that, how old were you and how, how did, what prompted that move, that decision so, to move there? Right after I got out of high school, I went for the first time. Me and a couple of buddies just jumped in van, drove there. I think we spent three weeks. Because at that time, San Francisco was like the, the main Yeah, place man, it, it was. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's all you saw in the magazines. Mm-hmm. But we went to Southern California first and then made our way up. Mm-hmm. It was a really weird experience. We were all a little bit disenchanted. And uh, that's when I, fir- I first met on that trip at EMB. I met Sean Young, who later became a good friend of mine. I was skating with every day. Fucking awesome. And his buddy Hurley, who ended up leaving San Francisco. But it was really weird. And it was like a lot of vibe, too. You know what I mean? And... Um, we stayed like three weeks and then drove directly home, like two and a half days, nonstop driving, you know, ran out of money. And then the next time I went back was actually with Lenny Kirk and this other dude, Preston Foster. Mm-hmm. The same thing, stayed for a little while, ran out of money, went back to California. And then the final time I went, I was, uh, was with my good friend, Will Daniel, and we, um, I bought this like 71 Plymouth Valiant. Mm-hmm. And it, it basically 
blew up like two weeks after I bought it <laughs> through mm-hmm. a rod in the engine. And then Will and I rebuilt the engine. We put a new engine in it, Slant 6. It was an old car, like just beautiful tank. It's a fun vehicle, and we were going to drive it to California. We got as far as Louisville, Kentucky, and I totaled it. Drunk driver ran a, ran a red light, totaled the car. Yeah. And he decided to stay in Louisville with other good friends of ours. And then uh, I started on a bus. I took a Greyhound bus, and I think I was somewhere in Colorado. And I was like, fuck it, I got to get off this thing. And, mm-hmm. and I got in a fight with a bus driver. I'm actually writing a, really? a book of sto- short stories about this whole time in my life. Okay. But I got in a fight with a bus driver. He wouldn't let me off the bus. I was like, get, you know, because it wasn't, it wasn't like, it was a stop for gas. It wasn't a stop oh. for people to get on and right. off. I actually got in a fight with him and ended up getting my uh, bag. Not a physical fight, but yelling, screaming. Yeah. And until people on the bus were like, fuck it, let him go. Just get yeah, rid of him. You know. Whatever, yeah. <laughs> so, like, I got my bag. And I remember the bus driving off. And literally, like, it was a gas station parking lot. You know where you got snow pushed up in all directions. Probably three foot of snow on the ground in Colorado. And I watched the bus drive off. And I was thinking, what the fuck did you do, man? <laughs> and then from there, I basically hitchhiked the rest of the way to California. I worked some places on the way, and um, yeah, it was crazy times. But um, yeah, and, and then you know, I lived on the streets for a while. You know what I mean? Whatever. Slept at Fort Miley. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, this was like also like at some point. At some point, my buddy Will had come back and met up with me. But I, you know, I had a, I got a job before I had an apartment. I was actually working at Deluxe packing Super Cush and nuts and bolts, and okay. I was like basically I would, I would skate all day. I'd, I'd come in there and pack the Super Cush in the morning. For a few hours, 10 cents a tube. And then I would go skate all day. And then after Deluxe was closed, this is when it was in Hunter's Point, I'd go back and climb over the fence. They had a barbed wire fence. I'd climb oh, over really? the fence. Oh, yeah, because it's shit. sketchy, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I would sleep under the... I had my sleeping bag, everything under the loading dock, man. I'd sleep under the loading dock. Did they know you were doing that? I mean, or? they didn't know then, though. I mean, yeah. Kurt knows now. The guy, like, Kurt DeWald, yeah. the guy who so basically they're... runs the thing. Yeah, because I had told him. Because he used to he used to always say to me, like, because basically I would sleep there, get up really early, climb back over the fence, and I'd be the first guy at work every morning. Oh, and, so and, they, wouldn't, <laughs> they wouldn't know, yeah. Yeah, and he was, like, he was like, man, you're the only guy who ever beats me to work, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, years later I told him, but, yeah. you know, it wasn't all the time, man. It was just, like, a scary place to be alone. Yeah, and imagine. so for me it was like if someone was going to come over that fence they had to come over the barbed wire and they had to you know they had to know where I was you know man yeah. I would hear them before they were coming type thing sure but and I didn't do it all the time you know what I mean like if I couldn't find a place to crash you know what I mean so sure so the first few months or years in San Francisco were kind of uh, all over the place you were, you were yeah I mean, I mean I went back to North Carolina a few times but when I finally came and stayed I stayed Okay. Which is probably, not, I think it was like 93, honestly, I came and stayed in 93. Okay. And then, you know, I worked, made a little money, got an apartment, roommate referral, you know, where you just rent a room. So it's a crazy thing. I think they still have it, but it's all digital now. But you used to go and look through notebooks of people looking for roommates and you write a profile. Really? And they were literally, and you paid for the service. So you went to this little place that was on the upper height and you would go in and look for notebooks and each was divided into neighborhoods or what type of person they were looking for. Damn, kind so, of like a dating service? Or, yeah, almost, man. Funny. Almost. for It's <laughs> called roommate referral. And I'm okay. pretty sure they probably still have it, but I'm sure it's all digital now. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, but, for sure. Yeah, but you I paid and went in and looked in notebooks. Uh-huh. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and at what time did you arrive in this famous apartment where you had the room that kind of started the whole book and everything? Was that at the end of your stay in San Francisco? Or? No, man. So what happened was, um, I was living at 916 Haight Street, which is the corner of Haight and uh, Divisadero, and I lived there for about a year. And my father died, and at one point, I I went back home after my my dad died. And kind of just got stuck there. When I left San Francisco, my buddy Brian Brooks, I rented out my room to him. So I would still have the room when I got back. Sure. Something happened with the apartment, all the roommates. I forget how it went down. But basically, while I was in North Carolina, he had to move out of the apartment. Okay. So he found another apartment just down the street, which turned out to be 107 Webster Street, where the story takes okay, place. Okay, that's right, yeah. So when I came back, he had a room there, and I slept on his floor. Mm-hmm. And he's a character in the book, too, if, you, you know, if you've read the book. But I slept on his floor until we discovered this room that was in the back of the apartment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this, this fucking house became a skateboard crash pad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was pretty crazy, man. How long did you spend in that apartment? I was in San Francisco for 10 years. 
So probably nine, actually probably nine in that in that apartment because I lived at the other place for a year. Okay. And I left maybe even maybe even a square ten because I left in January two thousand four. But crazy place, one yeah. seven Webster Street. Do you still have friends over there, or did it? Did it is it all outside of your? Uh, like, uh, you know what, my buddy Jed. As far as I know, I, I think he's still living in that apartment. I was just there, and I wanted to go knock on the door. Right. But I had we were only there for an evening, and I had two okay. kids and my yeah. wife. I was like, if Jed yeah. does answer the door, I'm gonna have to go in and have a beer. It's gonna be an yeah. all night affair. But yeah. I think he's I think he's still in that apartment, man. Okay. Right. Maybe some other time when you're alone. Oh, I'm going to, I mean, yeah, for sure, man. I mean, yeah. every, this is the first time I haven't done it. Every time I go to San Francisco, I knock yeah. on that door and he's always there and we, we drink some Tecates. <laughs> yeah. So. So, um, to go back into your career a little bit, when did you turn pro? Was that when you got on Consolidated or was that before? <clears throat> no, it was Consolidated and it okay. was literally, I mean, literally, I think I'd been on the team for like three months and then Jason just told me one day, he's like, Hey man, we're turning pro. And I was, okay. like, I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> no, he, was like, he, was like, he was like, yes, we are. And I'm like, no, you're not. You didn't feel ready yet? Or? No, we just, I, I mean, for me, like, yeah, it was, it was way too soon. I didn't feel like I had enough coverage. I didn't feel like people knew who I was. I didn't feel right. like people cared who I was. I also didn't, I was really skeptical about turning pro for a company that had guys like Karma and Allen, man. I mean, those guys were really amazing skateboarders. Yeah. This is Andy had just left. Andy Roy had just left. That's right, yeah. Um at he the went time to anti hero or something? Yeah, he yeah. went to anti hero. He just left. He was one of my favorites. For what he does, he's incredible. Like mm -hmm. there's no one better that does psycho skateboarding on a bowl, yeah. a mini ramp, whatever. Yeah. He's amazing. And um mm -hmm. also, you know, this is just after Jesse had left, Paez, Jesse Paez, who's right, just yeah. he's a powerhouse, man. Richard was still there. Richard was on the team, still had a board. It was just like, man, there's the history of this company and the guys that have worn that crown, if I can call it that. I'm like, dude, I don't know if I can rock that. Yeah, you know, it's like a lot of weight. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, so I was really skeptical about it. And um, Jason basically talked me into it. And I was like, all right. Yeah. You know, and I mean, it allowed me just, just having... At the time, I didn't get paid much either, but it allowed me to like to not have a day job and just skate all right. the time. Yeah, and it also allowed me to not only skate all the time, but be around other guys that were pro that were skating all the time and be mm -hmm. pushed by them. At the time, Cairo lived up the street. Foster, Cairo right. Foster, I was skating right. with him all the time. Mm -hmm. I was skating with Sean Young all the time. Karma lived right up the street. I was skating with Karma all the time. I mean, these are some like heavy hitters. Yeah. And, and just being able to be available and, you know, get in a van with those guys or just bomb some hills. Frankie, Frankie Gerber, man, I would skate with him all, all the right, time. Yeah. This is when, like, Anthony Claraval was around and I was filming right. I was filming for 411 with Anthony and, and, and Frankie was at the same time, too. We were going out every day at some point. I think he was still riding for the New Deal back then. He rode for the New Deal and then he was riding for the Firm. Well, it was only later he did Anti-Hero, but... Yeah, just being able to skate with guys like that, you know, and be pushed. Yeah. And pushing each other, you know. I hope that I was, you know. But for me, I always like to skate with guys that are better than you. You know, when you're yeah. skating with guys that are better they, than you. They, want, they push you to try to excel and yeah. get to that level. Yeah. And, yeah. Man, at the same time, like, you had, like, this Think Adrenaline house, houses that were just down the street. Dandra Hobel. Matt Reason was around, you know, we're seeing Jaya, Justin Strubing, all these guys, and you're just right. going to the spots and you're surrounded by these guys, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it's, it really changed the game, not having a day job it, so you can be available to, yeah. to hit some spots, some sessions, or hear about a pool or whatever's going on. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it changed the game, you know? So, so you were living in San Francisco, skating with all these guys, basically living a great pro skater life. And uh, at what point did you decide to come to France and write your novel? And how did this whole tr transition happen, basically? Well, honestly, what, what was happening to me, I mean, I had this, you know, a pretty privileged life, honestly, mm -hmm. man. And skating full-time and loving it and filming and documenting, shooting photos and just meeting a lot of great people. But what started to happen to me is, like, after I'd done the, the trip to Europe... I just really started to have new desires and started to change and want other things. I kind of figured like, wow, I can go there and skate and still work on other things. I don't have to be in California. A lot of things were happening too. Like I ended up quitting, uh, 
quitting consolidated then i did unbelievers with jeremy fish we had there's That's so right. much stuff that's happening mm -hmm. but what basically happened to me is after i did and it was a consolidated trip after i came to europe now i just fell in love with europe mm -hmm. and i didn't want to be in the states anymore and we'd also just done a trip to australia i just started to have all these experiences and then i was in japan you know all these experiences were just making me feel like i was coming home and i wasn't able to tell people yeah i couldn't express like what i was feeling or how i felt and I felt like everybody who was on the skate trips with me, they were just riding the wave, man. They were just doing it, going, and not anticipating the wave to ever end. And, I mean, it was like maybe 2001 when I, when I came back. Because I came here on a consolidated trip, and I decided I wasn't going to go home. I was, like, standing at the airport. I was at Heathrow, and everybody's getting on the plane. And I was like, fuck it, I'm not going. No. And I just didn't go, so I stayed here almost six months. Until basically I was having some visa trouble. I had to go home. And then I would come back here for three months for the next three years until I actually moved here. Just to be totally honest, man, I started to have so many injuries. I've now had seven, right. seven surgeries on my right knee. I have three crushed oh, discs seven. in my lower back. Damn. I've Damn. broke almost everything on the right side of my body at least once. I was going through this thing, and this is like every relationship with me, and you can maybe relate this to something in your life, is that when the pain outweighs the pleasure, mm -hmm. no matter what it is, I terminate the relationship. It hurts too bad. And I was hurting so bad at this point and trying to figure out how I was going to get out of this thing. For me, it's like no skate, no eat. When you think about that, it's yeah. like, man, I just built my whole life doing this thing. Yeah. I don't want to be in America. I don't want to be in California. I don't really want to be in the skateboard industry. I always wanted to write, so I kind of figured why well, I had a little money coming in. Maybe I should just sit down and try to write. And that's when I came here. I took a year. I lived in the French countryside, and that's all I did was write. And then, oddly enough, I didn't really even try to publish the book until almost 10, 10 years after. I was working on other stuff, and my wife was like, well, maybe you should try to get the first one published. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you moved to France. You, you wrote the book. Were you already fond of literature before that, or...? What kind of drove you to uh, write this book, uh, basically? Um, was that because you envisioned yourself as becoming a writer uh, in the future, or was it just because you felt like you had this urge to write and whatever comes out will I am um, basically, like, as a child, I was severely dyslexic. Okay. And at that time, they didn't really understand it. Right. And I was basically in, in special needs classes all the way up until I think the sixth grade when they discovered I had problems with my, my vision. And uh, oh, okay. so I didn't, I didn't actually even learn to read until I was almost 13 years old. Um, my mom taught me to read basically through phonics, sounding stuff out. I went from the special needs courses to the honor roll student, mm -hmm. like in a matter of six months. And I began reading and it was just like a big deal for me. From the moment I learned to read, I started writing stuff. I've basically been writing in journals since I was right. 15 years old. Like yeah. almost every day since I was 15 years old. I just had this thing even when I was really first learned to write. I was like, man, I want to write a book. I want to write a book. I want to write a book. I always wanted to do that. And even right. through all my, my years of skateboarding, it's a little bit of a joke now because I always had a book in my back pocket. Yeah. Everywhere, I always had a book in my back pocket. I was always reading something in the van. I was always reading something on right. the plane, at the spot, like wherever, man. Like mm -hmm. I was always reading something, but it was also a great hit pad. That's right. You, you, you know? said that on the, that little video piece you sent yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. If you look in Strongest of the Strange, if you watch that video almost every other clip, you'll see there's a book in That's my pocket. Right. And I discovered it by accident, you know, because I have really destroyed both of my That's hips, right. man. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I had a book in there and slammed really hard. It was actually, it was actually in, uh, was it 2,000 bull riders, man? Because I had the worst hippers, man. And I was like, oh, wow. And I mean, I've destroyed so many books that way. Mm -hmm. But it was like, you could read your hip pad. And you, yeah. did, you weren't wearing some goofy hip pad. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. it did become a, a bit of a joke that it was my hip pad as well. But yeah, okay. I was just always reading, you know? And so we talked about it at the beginning a little bit, but how did the project work with Pontus on The Strongest of the Strange? And how did you meet with him actually uh, in the first place? I think you guys both wrote for Carhartt or I was trying yeah, to think what the connection um, might have been. He actually wrote for Unbelievers for Heartbeat. So and after he quit Cliché and I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember who he was riding for before. I think it was Cliché. I think he wrote for Cliché and then eventually he made Polar, but... In between that, he had a couple boards with us. 
We were still doing Unbelievers. I had moved here. We had the connection through Carhartt. He just called me up one day and asked me if I wanted, he's like, I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make a video, you wanna be in it? I was like, yeah, awesome. What, what, you know, and I had all this footage I was, I was sitting on. Right. We also, there was also at the same time, the, the Carhartt video was in progress. And then it was like, where do I get my footage to? But in all honesty, he had asked me first. So I'd already sent him all these videos, which he got everything in the time code, got everything in the computer before I came up and we edited it together. But uh, yeah, it just came about. Pontus just called me up. Pontus is so hard, man, but for me, everything he does is excellent. It's not good. It's not okay. It's excellent. Everything he does is excellent. Fuck yeah, I'll be in your video. I didn't know what he was going to do. I just knew it was going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually flew up at the time. He didn't have a name for the video, and I flew up, and I had this Bukowski tapes. And then I was like, dude, you got to listen to this. Because yeah, I wanted to... Yeah, the intro of your part, right? Yeah, because I wanted to skate. I wanted to skate to uh, the, the, the genius poem, of the yeah. crown. The, right, crowd, right, right. the genius of the crowd. It's the... Yeah. It's just the heaviest shit and the way yeah. he reads it it's amazing and i wanted to skate to that but i was like listen to this and i, I played strong to the strange for him and then we're sitting there listening to it drinking a beer and i think that's when he was like that's a great name yeah you know strong to the strange because yeah. that's that's what all the shit is and he'd already showed me the footage he had of other guys and the way he was editing it and you it, know. it just fit like his uh, project and his, his yeah it just I mean it happened kind of organically you know what I mean right but that's where it came from was like this tape that you know I brought up that I wanted to use for music you had all this footage that you um, shared with him for the part yep uh, did you go on like a, on specific trips for that video or I'm pretty sure almost everything in that video was like old stuff I brought with me from San Francisco from trips other places there's some uh, footage of Japan in there for sure. There's a lot of stuff of Europe in there. Yeah, I remember um, there's some footage of you skating in Crete, I think. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. There's Crete is in there. Yeah. There's a Place d'Italie, that bank to the rail, I think that's in there. There's also all that footage from Shell, that, that squished down full pipe. Right, right, right. All yeah. that stuff is mm -hmm. here, but it was just stuff that I was collecting or people had filmed of me that I just had like I didn't go out and film anything specifically for Strong to the Strange it was just all stuff that I'd been compiling and didn't have a place to put it also he didn't care that it was all crappy high 8 footage or that there was a time code on something right. like, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that stuff I think it really worked we filmed some stuff at the skate park in his town but I don't think we even used any of that stuff mm -hmm. so all of it was pretty much pre-existing stuff and then all the stuff that happened, literally all the stuff that happened for the Carhartt video, I went to Barcelona, and I think Julian and I, Julian Dykmans, I think we went out right. and just skated together. All that stuff I think we filmed in like two days. Really? Wow. For the Yeah, it's just all stuff around Barcelona. I think we filmed all of it in like two days. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was one clip here in Paris that David Coolio filmed and we put in after. I can't remember, but... You know. I think the, the ender in your part is the, I don't know if it's the very last trick, but it's definitely in the last ones is the, the, the you actually mentioned it on the video you just did in Cal, in California this summer, uh, like the bank to a rail. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting to hear you talk about the, just discovering it basically and thinking, oh, that, that could be skatable and eventually seeing the, like the, the dumpster or whatever that's called. And yeah, it's a dumpster. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about Reese. Yeah. It's yeah. funny cause I went back and looked at that footage afterwards because i wanted to see if you could yeah. see the handrail that i'm describing yeah, yeah. that reese that reese slides and if you look in that footage mm -hmm. it's so crazy because it's uphill mm -hmm. and it's capped off and the ground is downhill it's so i mean yeah. reese just destroyed it man yeah, yeah but um, incredible skateboarder as well oh man he's yeah. so good yeah he's so he's just fun to watch too man he's a powerhouse man yeah that's what I mean about being available and being able to skate with guys like that. That basically happened because, you know, I was just like, hey, I'm going to do this. And Reese is like, no, you're not. And, you know, yeah, that, that's enough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? In a oh, fun way, we really try it. to push each other, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so eventually, once you had all the footage, you, you told me, I think you went to see Pontus and you edited the video with yeah. it. Uh, not the video, but like your part. Just my part. Yeah, yeah. it's just my part. And did you, how did you pick the, the song, the Leonard Cohen song? Well, it was basically... Um, uh, this is uh, this is revealing. So basically, what happened was I wanted to use the uh, genius of the crowd, right. which, which we started with, yeah. and I wanted to do everything slow mo, which we did the majority of it yeah. slow motion for, for the, the for the rhythm part, yeah. for the yeah for the rhythm. Right. And then um, I had more footage. Pontus wanted to use the footage. I wanted to use the footage, so we had to choose another song. I'd love Leonard Cohen yeah. and. 
Basically, I'd had a breakup in San Francisco, which was the big uh, final deciding point for me. Like, everywhere I walked, everywhere I went, there was, like, ghosts. I had memories everywhere. This girl who I was, you know, crazy in love with. I still love her. She's a fantastic woman. Mm -hmm. And um, I just couldn't be there anymore. And she always referred to me as her lover. And mm -hmm. I always referred to her as a lover. We were both kind of not faithful, if I can say that. Okay. But, I mean, she's my girl, whatever. So that was a response to to her, like because the song is "Lover, Lover, Lover." You right, know? right, right. Yeah, that was a, it. Was a good uh, a good choice as well. Again, when I saw it the first time, I was like, "Wow, this is a strange song to skate to." <laughs> but yeah, no, it makes sense actually. Now that well, you know. after we broke up, she disappeared, like uh -huh. just plain and simply disappeared. Like changed her address, changed mm -hmm. much like I write about in the novel she just kind of disappeared and and the, the lyrics are lover 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 come back to me yeah yeah so it was like a little i don't know if she yeah, ever saw like the a video weird, or she yeah, cared yeah. about scott Bourne after we broke up i don't yeah. know but maybe but, she'll listen to this who knows yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i doubt it I don't know. we'll see i always loved at that time how the videos had amazing music especially that video like I discovered Joy Division and many like cool bands thanks to uh, especially that video. Yeah, the but, soundtrack like, is skate, amazing skate in that video, man. And uh, I was just thinking amazing. to myself, like, how did he pull this off? Because like, to, I don't think today you could do a video like that with that music without paying a shit ton of money in music rights. Yeah, so, well, I guess he probably barged it at the time. And it, yeah, I don't, I don't remember how it happened. Yeah. I just remember like him going for it. But you know, for me, like music and skateboard videos is such a yeah. primary like, it's like pretty source. much half of the of yeah the it's it's art. Yeah. it means so much and it's also yeah. how i've discovered so much music like the old right. santa cruz you know with, with fire hose or yeah man what did what did uh mike v skated to some crazy songs too or mm -hmm. jason lee i remember that that milk song man that he skated to you know i think it's just a really great way to find new music and be yeah. turned on to, to good music sure and um i like it the pontus like really like joy division that's so awesome man like mm -hmm. how did you pull that off like man i remember it's like one of the most epic parts ever and i'm a fan man i love rodney mullen he's yeah. so incredible mm -hmm. man but where he, i think it's rubbish heap where he skates to uh louis armstrong and really? I think to uh, myself, really, oh, well, I don't remember that. That. it's okay. so incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. incredible. I used to check yeah. that out. That's and he awesome. skates to a Cat Stevens song too, if I remember. Okay. I mean, but it's wow. amazing, you know. And and it's not. It doesn't have to all be screamy, yelly, crazy punk rock. Yeah, no, no, of course. Yeah. So yeah, man, the soundtrack yeah. to Strong's is strange, man. That's Pontus. Yeah. yeah. basically retired from skateboarding from professional skateboarding at least what, I mean how did that happen honestly it was kind of like a slow process god there's a long story behind all of that but I was like 35 I was really hurting and I was still you know still getting paychecks from skateboarding I was going on very few trips mm -hmm. I mean the last real trip I did was Eastern Europe man and that's kind of when that's kind of when I knew I was over man done yeah I was like 35, I was in the van with a lot of young kids that were really crushing it. Ferret Batar was on that trip, he's so good, mm -hmm. he's no longer on the planet. But, uh, That's right, yeah. Uh, he, he used to ride for Carhartt or Vans or... Yeah, both. both. And yeah. Yama. And Yama. But and he was Yama, on the trip. Right, yeah, yeah. He really pushed me on the trip, man. I love skating with that guy. He was mm. such a, a, just a beautiful force and a happy, yeah, let's go for it. Like, he loved skateboarding. He was so fun to skate with. But he really pushed me on that trip and I got like... I got some really good tricks on that trip, but there's a board slide that was probably my last board slide <laughs> and probably my best board slide. It was really, really big with a drop over the side. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's footage of it somewhere, but yeah, I remember him really pushing me and it was so big and that was definitely my last trip where I actually skated and felt good. And then from then on out, it was like I was still doing Puma. I had events with Puma. A shoe came out and they were paying me to do events here and there. So I was barely skating. I would, I would like literally... At the time, I was living with my buddy Cedric Beer, and he was actually a skateboarder, but a, a model as well as a photographer, and he would just see me come home broken, 
and he was like, man, what are you doing? And yeah, what are you doing to yourself? Or, yeah. yeah, and he's the guy who actually got me into modeling because I was like, yeah, man. I wanted to ask you about that as well, yeah. Okay. Well, I was like, again, no skate, no eat. I didn't have a visa. I was living here illegally. How long did you stay without a visa? In I, mean, I, was, I think I was here for more than five years, maybe six. Yeah. I don't know. And, and just juggling everything and all my money had to go through the States. So I was paying transfer fees for my money to go there. So it looked like it was there. I had a right. friend of mine who had a card, a credit card of mine with my code. So I would send him checks and then he would deposit checks. So it looked like bank wise, it looked like I was there. Right. And I was doing all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff to stay here. I can't tell you how much money I spent on transfer fees. It was like, so, yeah. So this whole time you were in France, you didn't go back to the States? No, I was going back to sometimes three times a year. You know, I was still doing stuff with companies in California. And I would go back for like a month okay. at a time. When you went through customs, they wouldn't ask you like, uh, Oh man, I had like, doing, like, where you look, here, look, or? to this day, I still carry it, look. Still carrying my wallet, California ID. Right. Oh, and, okay. And, okay. And I would look, and it's behind, it's a, behind my carte de sigil. Right, right, right. To this day, I still carry it, but I would be like, hey, so, you know, I, and I had it rigged. I would buy round trip tickets mm -hmm. to America, but not fly back on it because it's okay. cheaper. But if you buy oh, yeah, a ticket yeah. like that, you're flagged. They're going to pull you over and say, hey, you're an American. You've got a round trip ticket. Are you living here? Do you have papers? Do you yeah. work here? What are you yeah, doing? Yeah. They're going to your flag. They are going to ask you. Mm -hmm. And I would say, no, no, no. I'm going, going back to California. I live in California. Mm -hmm. And they would be like, well, why do you have a round trip ticket? And I'd be like, oh, well, it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. So you're not flying back on it. No, I'm not, I'm not flying back on it. So yeah. I would never fly back on that ticket. Mm -hmm. I would always buy a round trip ticket from the States. I spent a lot of money doing it, man, yeah. um, just to yeah. not get flagged and uh, end up in trouble. But I still carry California ID if I, if something happens. I always pull that out first and sure. just play dumb. Yeah. But, so, yeah, I was still going back and forth, but the money was dwindling. The shoe thing happened with Puma, but I don't want to go into that story publicly, but it was a bad deal. Because okay. you, you wrote for Vans before, right? And yeah, Vans before Puma, and then yeah. it was a short period. Remember that brand, Savier? Right, yeah, which Brian yeah. Anderson the first did. First Nike uh, project, yeah. Yeah, so I got fluid shoes from them okay. at some point, and then the Puma thing happened, so I just totally went with Puma. Okay. Yeah, I was running out of money. I didn't have a visa, and the thing about the modeling is, is I didn't have to have a visa to model. And honestly, and I mean, I think I told the story before, man. My first job I did for L'Oreal, it was three hours. It was a hair care products. Three mm -hmm. hours, I made seven grand. I didn't have to jump down any steps. Wow. I didn't have to bust my balls on a handrail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like fucking, I was hurting seven so bad. Yeah, it was crazy. seven grand. It was three, three hours. hours. Three hours in front of the camera. Wow. It was seven grand. Then it got, well, you got to pay, you got to pay 60, 40. Basically, you, you come home with less than half of that by the time you pay your yeah, agency yeah, and you sure. pay your taxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, it's still a money. I mean, yeah. yeah. Are you crazy? Yeah. And then it got, option to other countries so like out of nowhere spain's gonna use it i got a check for two grand you know germany wants to use it i got a check for two grand you know like residuals so i ended up ended up getting into that thing which was kind of nice for a while instagram has kind of ruined it for me because i refuse to do phones and instagram oh, so okay. it makes it hard they really want you know if it comes down to me for a job or you and you have an Instagram account, chances are you're going to get it because they want your followers. They want to see you posting. Yeah. They want the free, they want the free publicity yeah, 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 yeah. that your 10,000 or million yeah. followers. Yeah. And so, so when did this first um, modeling gig uh, take place? I was already 35 and I'm 48 now. So yeah, I got into it late in the game. But what happened is like, <laughs> that's another thing, you know, as a pro skateboarder, it's not really cool to have gray hair. But as a model, <laughs> yeah, especially in France, a country that no offense to the French, but <laughs> men don't have like strong hair. Does well, you know what I mean? You so, have a good example. Yeah, <laughs> that's like, so, so no offense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, thinking, yeah. I have a full head of really thick gray yeah, yeah, hair, yeah, yeah. and For sure, yeah. yeah, I ended up doing so much, much hair care products. Yeah, no, and, I can uh, not sense. just hair care, but suits and ties. Like formal, you know, men that are buying very expensive, you know, luxury suits. They don't want to see an 18 year old kid in the suit. You know, they want to see yeah. themselves. They want to see an older sure. man. Yeah, yeah. So I did a lot of suits and ties. I mean, I did a lot of fashion stuff too, but that yeah. stuff in all honesty, to be totally brutal, it doesn't really pay. Oh really? Okay. Um, hair care products is where the money is. Yeah. At. I mean, yeah. when you get a gig like that, yeah, you, you can yeah. make some cash. And then, like I said, the residuals that come back are, you know, so you were basically transitioning from pro skating to modeling 
And in the middle of all this, stuff, of course, you were writing as well, but these were more like passion projects, basically. Yeah, well, that's it. You know, I was trying to find a way to maximize my desk time. I was trying to find a way that I could I could write and keep writing sure. mm -hmm. as my checks from, from skateboarding were starting to dwindle, you know. And when I say dwindle, like I had a lot of photo incentives and, and to make photo incentives, you got to be in the magazines. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when I wasn't skating as much, I wasn't making as much money. I don't. I mean, I had sponsors that stuck with me. One of the greatest sponsors I've ever had is Carhartt. And even when I said I'm not skating, I'm tired. I don't want to do it anymore. Like at the time, Lars Driver, who was the team manager, he was like Scott. He's like, you've done so much. We like having you associated with the team. You know, blah 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 blah. So he kept me on. And then even after he left, Bertrand Trichet took it over. Right. And I think I did another maybe two years before they cut my paycheck, which is fair enough. I wasn't skating. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, that was a fantastic relationship with Carhartt. The Puma thing after I quit the shoe, that was over. But yeah, I was just trying to maximize desk time. And like you can do one model gig a month or two or three. And then you got the rest of the month to write. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think it was a surprise for a lot of people. And I took a lot of criticism about doing the modeling thing. But for me, yeah. you know what? It was all about maximizing my time. And it still is. If I get a call from my agent this morning and I get a job, I'm going. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Do you still do it today? I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still, okay. I still do castings and stuff. I haven't had sure. any real work in okay. a while, but like I said, it's like it's kind of hard not doing the Instagram thing. You know what I mean? And not even having a phone, you know. Yeah. Just before before we get into that, since we're on writing, so you mentioned you you wrote you wrote a room with no windows basically in the early 2000s when you yeah. were coming to France and you stayed in the countryside. You didn't publish it until almost 10 years later, right? Yeah, I wrote, I mean, I'm, I think I came here with 80 pages that I wrote right. in San Francisco. I moved here January 2004. And I started writing here. I rented a small apartment and it was like for six months. And then after six months, honestly, I basically ran out of money. And I'd sworn off skateboarding just because it hurt so bad. Mm -hmm. This is early January 2004. And I was 30 at the time. And I was like, man, I ran out of money. The Carhartt thing happened. They came to me. Lars wanted me on the team. I actually just basically told him in the beginning, I'm not going to do interviews. I'm not going to do contests. I don't want to shoot ads. And he's like, okay, cool. And I was like, really? Mm -hmm. You're going to pay me for that? Awesome. So I joined the team. And, and if, to, be, to be honest, man, he got me so excited and so inspired that it just gave me another five years, man. The best interview I think I ever done was with Benjamin for uh, Kingpin. Right. And that was right, just because yeah. I was skating with Lars and being around Lars and the team. It was amazing. Yeah. But I ran out of money, did a round the world trip. I literally did the Mongolia thing, came yeah. back to Paris and then flew directly to Japan and then came back to Paris again and then went to San Francisco. I, I could have flown around the globe yeah. and I should have gone <laughs> from here, but yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Made a little money and then I rented a little house with a friend. How did you find this house and this opportunity, basically? I mean, it's kind of a crazy story. So my really good friend, Manu, had this friend, Gabrielle Lawrence is her name. Mm -hmm. I, I affectionately referred to her as Lawrence, and she always called me Born. But she lived out there, and I'd gone there for a party years before, before I lived here. And it was just a beautiful town. It's in the Rambouillet. Rambouillet. Yeah, 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 in the forest. Oh, so it's not so far from Paris. Like an no, hour it's, it's like, yeah, it's 45 minutes on the fast train. Okay, okay. So I had, at some point, when I'd moved here, I'd called her and I would go out there on weekends, sometimes just to spend, you know, a weekend in the country. I became good friends with her. She gave me a book that I really liked, that inspired me, that I kind of wrote the model around for my book. And she knew I was, I was here and that I was writing a book. And at one point she had said to me, like, hey, you know, like, because I'm not using a computer. She's like, do you have a copy of it? You know, like... Could I read part of it? I want to see it. So I think I photocopied the first hundred pages of it. So there'd be a copy of it. And sure. one weekend I'd gone out there and I gave it to Lawrence. And she, you know, she didn't read it then, but she read it and she called me up a few days later and she's like, Scott, this is fabulous. I love this thing. Like, wow, you're gonna keep writing, it. keep doing it. And so when when I left the apartment here, I called everybody I knew and just, hey, you know, I'm looking for a place, you know anybody? And I called Lawrence and she said, look, I have a room. You can't live here. You can stay until you, you finish the book. But if you want to come here and write, and I was like, wow, because mm -hmm. I really want to get out of Paris. I want to get away from people. Yeah. Fantastic opportunity. So yeah. she really blessed me with that opportunity. At the time, she's British and she was going back and forth between the countryside and somewhere in Great Britain to do shiatsu for horses. She was learning shiatsu for horses. Okay. So basically, I spent a lot of time there alone. 
she wasn't there all the time, so right. it was even better for the yeah. writing. For your concentration. Yeah. And, yeah. and when she was around, it was great too because you go a little crazy, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, this village is like 10 houses in the village, you know, it's that, man. And yeah. then, like, there's no bar, there's yeah. no restaurant, you know? Uh, all the women are 10 years older than me or 10 mm. years younger than me or 20 years older mm. or 20 years younger. You know what I mean? Right. So when she was around, yeah, we had meals together and drank and had some fabulous nights like in some of the neighboring villages. And mm -hmm. I think we crashed into a boar together. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. But it was fantastic. But anyhow, when I did finish the book, like I really panicked. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't been seeing anyone. I hadn't really been seeing any women. I hadn't really, hadn't really had a drink. I mean, there was nights that Lawrence and I definitely drank, but sure. just not, you know, not doing anything that any normal 30 something year old guy was doing. And, uh, my relationship with Lawrence was not romantic at all, but I mean, it was very romantic in the sense that we had a lot of fun, but I wasn't yeah. involved with her, sure. but, uh, immediately like I made phone calls and my buddy Cedric, who I ended up moving in with, he, he had just moved back to Paris with his girlfriend. They found a place two bedroom did I want to move in in a matter of 24 hours after I finished the novel man I'd literally you were out of there yeah, just, <laughs> yeah I was out but it was a, probably outside of wife and kids it was definitely the most fantastic year of my life just mm -hmm. being alone yeah. in the countryside writing doing what you love yeah Yeah, and then the, like I said the moments with Lawrence she, she was just such an incredibly romantic and fun person like everything she did she was just kind of magical you know Born, you know, born, you need a break. And she'd bring me tea or like, let's dance, born. And we'd drink wine and, and dance. And then we'd yeah. go to a, a village and yeah, basically get drunk and have great food. And I mean, it was, it was like, yeah, it was really great living there. Great year. Cool. So once you finished the book and you moved back here, did you want to get it published or did you just sit on it for um, a while? What, how, what happened? Well, this, this, the long story behind that is that I didn't really try to get it published. I don't know what I was thinking. I just kept writing. I felt like I was running out of time. I still had time to write. Sooner or later, this modeling thing was going to give out. I still had a little money from skateboarding, not much. I'd met my wife. We'd moved in together. We had no kids at the time. But she was the one that was like, why don't you try to get that published? I mean, long story short is, is basically I started sending out submissions to, which is a big pain in the ass. Crap, I got one right here I'm, I'm working on mm -hmm. for another novel. But sending out submissions to agents and you got to get an agent and all this stuff is just a pain in the ass. It's really yeah. time consuming and I wanted to write. Anyhow, I ended up doing that. I had an agent that was interested in it, uh, agent in New York City. I flew there. I saw him. He liked the book. Basically, had a pretty nice publishing deal with a really nice advance. Um, but they wanted to cut 100 pages of okay. the novel. Because the first uh, initial draft was how, how many pages? Do you remember? I think it was 420. But I'm going to pull it out right now and see what this says. Here's what any new writer or any young writer should know about the publishing industry. Basically, in America, no one's going to publish a first-time novelist mm -hmm. whose book is more, hundred, more than 300 pages. First-time mm -hmm. novelists, they want you to be between 250 yeah. to 300 pages, not more. People won't make a commitment sure. to a novel that size for someone they don't know. This is all statistics, okay, right, right, mind right. you? Yeah. So they wanted to basically cut 100 pages, not for my storytelling or my writing. Right. I actually, yeah, I actually said, okay, what 100 pages? And I was yeah. told, it doesn't matter, Scott, whatever 100 pages you want. And I said, well, it's a plot-driven novel. Yeah. And, and I was actually told, it doesn't matter, Scott. No one cares about plot-driven novels anymore. So if you noticed in this book, when we did publish, which I'll show you right now, so I'm gonna look at this one. It's 326 here. Okay, right. But they wanted, they basically wanted to cut it to 250. Is basically what happened. But I don't know if you noticed in this book, I intentionally had all the page numbers giant. I asked the designer, I was like, I want <laughs> giant page numbers. Okay. Yeah, that's true. They are pretty big. Yeah. In here, you and can definitely a, see them. We also did another little cool thing here, but no one knows that but you. Oh, okay. <laughs> you see it? Yeah. yeah. So basically, I turned down a pretty nice publishing deal with a reputable publishing house with a nice advance because I, I, I just couldn't cut 100 pages out of my book. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's what happened. Then it came back and basically sat on my desk for a long time. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, the guys that started 1980, that publishing house, had sent me an email. They were interested in me. 
I met with them just to see if I could work with them. Their first project they did was actually East of the Adriatic, which was a, a book that I did with uh, right, uh, Sergey. Uh, Lars has photos in there. Bertrand Trichet has photos. Yeah. It's basically my writing. There's a few of my photos in there, but not a lot. So that project worked. And then because it worked, I asked them if they were into doing a novel. And they were like, yeah. So we did the novel and I got to do it the way I wanted to. Just basically the backlash of doing it that way is, is mm -hmm. you know, it was published through a French publisher, so I had to do the proofread myself, which mm -hmm. you just can't proofread your own stuff. It's an editing nightmare, but, like, as far as a book goes, I'm really happy with it. It's, like, for me, yes. it's, yeah, it's, like, a first... I just couldn't write like that anymore. I'm too experienced now. So when I look at that book mm -hmm. and all the, the, the mistakes that I feel are mistakes, no one else really sees them, but yeah. I, they're such pure mistakes. It, it's just a work of art, man. It's yeah. like, I just wanted to write. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about agents, publishers. I didn't know about editors. I didn't know about anything. I just wanted to write, and that's what I did. I sat down and wrote, but I feel that that's the thing that's captured in that book. So that was the first book. And so when did you find the deal to have it published? Was that basically 10 years later? Yeah, man. I, I mean, yeah, it was more than 10 years later. I think I was like 31, 32 when I finished it. And so 31, did, 32. I and think you I was said like, your wife kind of encouraged you to uh, yeah, she have was, it released. Basically. Yeah, she was just like, hey, why don't you do something with that? Because yeah. I, I just got turned off to the publishing industry, dealing with people. And for me, I wasn't depending on you know writing for a living. You know, there's no, there's no money in it anyway. You know what I mean? No. So, Very so little, yeah. I wasn't pressed. It was something I wanted to do. It was like an accomplishment. I don't know. It's like today I'm going to learn to kickflip. So you just work on it. You work on it. You work on it. Then you do the kickflip and you're like, awesome. I can kickflip now. Next thing. Mm -hmm. I want to learn a three flip. So that's kind of the way I felt about it is like I completed it. It didn't need to be published. I didn't care. But yeah, I just wanted to write other things. I'd immediately gone into another novel. I have 13 manuscripts in that closet that mm -hmm. no one's seen. They're not all novels. You mm -hmm. know, some of it's poetry. I mean, yeah, there's a memoir I'm working on. You know what I mean? I have like so much stuff. But yeah. the point the point is, is that uh, I didn't feel it was important to, to necessarily show it. What I felt like is I want to write. I'm going to keep writing. And so the next thing I went into is the story that I'm shopping now that I'm trying to get published, which is basically about the place I grew up and a group of boys, a childhood pact, you know, a suicide. Okay. So it's really based around the guys. So your with, childhood before San Francisco. Yeah, it's before San Francisco. It's kind right. of before that. And it's all okay. based around real guys. But the point was is that I didn't care about publishing it. It was basically my wife was like, hey, why don't you try to do something with that? And then when this opportunity came with the guys in 1980, mm -hmm. then I was like, yeah, for sure. Like, get it off the desk. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? As I said, it wasn't about money anyway. It was about, if it was about money, I would have cut 100 pages, probably been an, another markup in the publishing world and been able to get a next publishing deal. I don't know. So 10 years later, I think I was almost 40. My wife was like, get it off the desk. <laughs> <laughs> Do something with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, you know, I was really proud of it. Honestly, I bound it. As I showed you, I'd had it bound and yeah. put it on the bookshelf, man. You know what I yeah. mean? So. So since the book was released, you've been in Paris with your wife, your kids, part-time modeling, doing some writing on the side. Yeah. Um, and we'll come to the an act of imagination. Yeah, in yeah, second. for sure. Yeah, modeling. I was doing a lot more than I am now. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a few writing gigs, not many. There's no, there's almost no money in it, you know? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, my wife and I, we started the shop. This has been a 10-year project for us. It's something that we talked about like more than 10 years ago now and okay. that she's always wanted to do. My wife worked in fashion for years for big brands like, you know. Yeah. So she's been a sales director right. for some really big, you know, brands here in Paris and just really felt like she had kind of a soulless place there you know what I mean it's just you know produce sell produce yeah. sell produce sell and then she's just traveling constantly traveling and you know we have kids now and she didn't want to travel and we had this project years ago about basically the idea was like to to have a shop that has like renewable things right all right. artisanal things things mm -hmm. that have a second life that get reused or repaired not recycled reused or repaired like they have a real life and so the concept behind the shop is everything is basically artisanal it's most everything is made in france and or europe there's no plastic in our store right um right. like all most of our toys are german they're all made out of metal or wood we have really old uh, workwear brands like laborer mm -hmm. everything is made to last 
what we say is like no no landfill living. Like we're totally and completely fed up with this idea of things that are produced that no matter what are destined for a landfill. We have this stuff, this enamelware. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It has it's inexpensive. It doesn't break. It has you know a long yeah. life. Whereas like I don't know, it's a a good example is like and not to point at anyone or name names, but ninety nine percent of the stuff that you buy at IKEA is destined for the landfill. Whether it's an inexpensive couch or some shelving, like, you know. And we did have some of that in our house before we moved here. Like, you take it apart, you can never get it back together. It's almost disposable living. So that's what we wanted to do is, is what we call no landfill living. Like, sure. these things aren't going in a landfill. They're not destined for a landfill. Mm-hmm. You know, the old toy is going to be passed down mm-hmm. or it's going to be in an antique shop or it's just going to be on display somewhere because it's just a neat object. Right, right. So that was the idea behind the store. And after my wife, she was actually at Carolina Herrera at the time. After she left there, she had two years of uh, shimage. So yeah. we decided this was, this was the time. We're going to do it. Yeah, we're going to do it. And started looking for a spot. This whole COVID thing happened, which is another killer. But at the same time, what it's done is made people really aware mm-hmm. of what we're doing to the environment. And they yeah. just can't throw things away. Sure. Yeah. So we opened the shop. Uh, it was actually a perfect timing, I think. You're, you're, well, if you can call it that, but I mean, I mean, it was, but it wasn't. People are going to be more sensitive to your uh, whole philosophy and, and what what you're trying to, you know, spread awareness. About. That that has definitely happened, but we because. I spent so long in California and my wife grew up in California. We we're both San Francisco. That's yeah. where all our backers were from. Everybody mm-hmm. was basically from the Bay Area. We had some other friends, people we, you know, asked for money. But when uh, when COVID hit, a lot of people backed out. And then if you remember last year, man, the fires hit right. California. Yeah. Really. Oh, yeah. And after the fires hit, I mean, it was dark for like three days in California. Mm-hmm. The sun basically didn't come up for the smoke. Yeah. And it was a crazy time, and so most most of our other backers understood nothing against them. So a lot of people backed out. Then we had a bank loan. We were already in. We couldn't get out, man. We got to, we had to go for it. So basically, all the renovations, like my wife and I, with a couple friends, we did ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, just went in, ripped up the floor, tore out the ceiling, did yeah, did all the work on our own, which was really nice after being COVID lockdown. You know, and we opened the store the Sunday before Christmas, man. And I can't tell you how many people came in and were basically happy to not yeah. be buying things online yeah. not Absolutely, you yeah. know like they just wanted to shop they yeah. wanted to do christmas shopping they wanted to buy real stuff and so it's called landline yep. and it's in the 11th right it's, it's, not it's on route it's, it's 107 paramontier which is oh, yeah. kind of funny because okay. 107 yeah. Webster. Is, yeah, 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 yeah webster street is like my lucky number but right right yeah it's yeah well that was another omen you know what uh-huh. i mean like when yeah. we found the spot but yeah so i think the concept's really good it's doing really yeah. well and so you, your, your wife is working there every day do, do you she's work there, there a little bit or she's there almost every day okay. i try to be there between 12 and 3 okay so i try to write in the morning and i try to go there around 12 basically try to handle the stocking the pricing it's upstairs downstairs as a whole i mean this is a learning curve too we're really right. learning yeah. we've never done this before so yeah, yeah. Basically, if I don't go in for a day or two, you can be for sure at the bottom of steps, there's a mound of cardboard yeah. and all the stuff that comes in, it needs to be priced, like we get piles in the shop. So so I'm trying to be there for at least, you know, three hours a day and then I go pick up, you know, we got two kids. Yeah. Um, that's another thing that's important to us is that one of us should always pick up our kids and drop off our kids. I think this year we're going to have to find someone to help help me with at least one day. Okay. Yeah, so that's basically the routine. I mean, yeah. if you come by during those hours, you're probably going to find me. Or, or if you yell down the steps, I'm probably in the dungeon <laughs> and doing the stocking. Yeah, but it, I mean, it's basically my wife's. This is her, her project for sure. Right. I've been happy to help her with it, but it's really her project. The aesthetic of the store, you know, we really wanted it to have like a really general store type of feeling. And we also wanted it to have like be a beautiful space Uh, we lucked out because the floor is this really old herringbone antique hardwood oak french floor it was actually under about two inches of concrete Mm -hmm. and then tile okay and because we had to redo the floor i just wanted to break it up before we did it to see and we found this this floor under it me and my buddy dave who actually does he does the voice for the trailer for the oh, children's book right, right yeah. him and i him and i ripped the whole floor up ourselves with a crowbar sanded mm-hmm. it 
I mean, it's extra work, but it really added to the aesthetic of what we're trying to do. Like, it was a pair of pharmacy when we got it. Okay. So I feel like the space, what we did to the space was like restore an old Parisian building. Mm-hmm. It was nothing but disposable crap, shelving, particle board, and an ugly floor, a drop ceiling. We ripped all that stuff out. And the space just looks beautiful now. And that was a big deal for the aesthetic of the store. We wanted it to be a beautiful place you come in and fill it with beautiful objects. Mm-hmm. You know, stuff you want to keep, not stuff yeah. you want to throw away. Sure. And you can get a three euro carrot peeler Mm. or you can get we just got macintosh i mean you know the classic macintosh i mean they're a thousand euros but that's the price range you got something that's a thousand or something that's three these things these beautiful you know enamelware cups they cost Mm. seven euros you're gonna have it your whole life you can take it camping you can also put it on the stove and warm up your coffee or your tea you know what i mean like it's nice to have that price range too you know sure Let's talk a little bit about the book then. So it's called An Act of Imagination. And for the people who are listening, it's uh, basically a poetry, but destined to children in the first place, I guess. That was the initial intent. It's like a really organic project in a sense that kind of happened on its own. And mm-hmm. I actually like to tell this story because it's a bit ridiculous. Just because I'm a father and I have two kids, I'm really involved with the kids and I play with the kids all the time. And I'm always saying silly stuff to the kids. For instance, like my daughter's name is Dillinger Cassidy. And because of the nature of this name and she's a little girl, I started calling her Dilly for short. Mm -hmm. Instead of Dillinger, just Dilly. That turned into the Dill Pickle. And then from there, it turned into the Pickle. So Mm -hmm. her nickname became the Pickle. We still call her Dilly or Dill Pickle. So I'll just say silly stuff. Like one morning, I I was just playing with her. She jumped in bed. I'm there with my wife. And I said something like, Dillinger Cassidy Pickle wore a mask and rode side saddle on a giraffe. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that sounds kind of good. And so I just wrote it down, you know. She was a cucumber gone sour, driven mad by power. And this is how it started to happen. So that, of course, as you know, you've read a book. That became one of these silly children's poems, but inspired about my daughter. There's another one in there, Tennessee the Tender T-Rex. My son's name is oh, Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. The vegetarian yeah. T-Rex. Right? So when he, was, yeah. when he was two and a half, he basically saw a duck at, at the park. Uh-huh. And he understood I was eating duck for dinner. And then he understood, Dad, is that the... That's a duck, like a duck in the park. Mm-hmm. And from then on out, he stopped eating meat. So I okay. came up with Tennessee, the tender T-Rex. And so just saying all these silly things all the time around the kids. And I started to write them down. And my wife has always said to me, she's like, she's like, I wish I could draw. I would draw some of this silly stuff you say all the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, bing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, who could draw this shit? I was yeah. like, who's going to draw like Tennessee, the tender T-Rex? Yeah. So that was it. Like immediately I was like, Todd Ratchard. I just sent Todd emails like, hey, Todd, I'm writing the silly stuff for my kids. I want to make a children's book. Would you be interested in it? Like illustrating it. I I told him I want it to be black and white, kind of in the the feel of Shel Silverstein. I don't know if you know who he is. No. He's an American writer, poet, but he wrote children's books, The Giving Tree. Okay. Where the Sidewalk Ends. Really cool stuff. So I told him I wanted it to be really simple because Mm -hmm. Todd's artwork can be really complex. But I know from working with him at Consolidated that he's always drawing on stuff and just these little crazy doodles on everything. And so I just told him I really want it to not be complex. And he was like, okay, well, send me a few of the poems and let's see what happens. When I sent him this stuff, he loved it, thought it was cool. He started illustrating them. They started to come. And I was like, wow, we're going to do this book. So that was another project that my wife and I, we did together. I uh, kind of feel like, because there's a lot of stuff in there about the digital age and about giving screens to kids, I was like, I'm not even going to give this to an agent. I don't even want to shop this book. Bukowski the Bookworm. Is (laughs) is that appropriate for a children's book? I was like, there's all these things that they're going to tell me I have to take out of it. Yeah. So I just decided, like, let's do it ourselves. My wife was really behind it. We're making a book for our kids, so we created a little publishing house and just did it on our own. That book, Mm -hmm. we've sold, in the first seven months, we sold almost... 1,800 copies, which is unheard of for an independent publisher putting out a first book. I still have a few left. I have less than 200 left. How did you um, sell it, basically? Did you uh, put it up on a website or... 
We did pick up a distributor here in France, just in France. Right. Um, and they put it up on Amazon, which we did not do. They put it on Fnac and all this stuff, which right. is fine. Mm -hmm. But to be honest with you, they, they only took 100 books. And uh, I think they have more than half of them left. Right, right. Because they're not pushing it. Because it's just well, one and out of their... That's the thing, though. That's the thing is that distributors, that's not their job to push it. Well, yeah. You know what I mean? It's Pollen Distribution. They're the biggest distributor of English books in France. So it's okay. a really good place to be. But what happened was basically because I had all these connections with skateboarding, I just sent out a group of emails to, hey, do you know any skate shops might be interested? And then one shop got five and then another shop got 10. And then like Kevin Marks, who does Look Back at Library, he gave me a list because I was like, hey, what skate shops do you know that might be interested in books? Because he deals in that. So he sent me a list. I emailed them and then boom, we just, we sold most of the books either on our website people came to our website or skate shops all over europe and mm -hmm. all over um the states you know the t-shirt that i gave you we yeah. did a, we did that with that, strange buddy. love mm -hmm. so on the new book yeah. the next book we're going to do a whole series of t-shirts and hopefully a series of boards with strange love yeah. and i'm hoping that they're going to take over distribution just for the united states so i won't have to deal with the postage so it's a cool project and yeah, like i said yeah. it's another little thing my wife and i did basically for the kids and uh first time i produced my own work it was really fun like I said, also no one can tell you no when you do your own stuff. Yeah, you know, I can exactly. have Bukowski the bookworm, you know. <laughs> but. No, it was really cool because I, I found pretty much everything I sort of knew a little bit about you. You mentioned this character of Bukowski the worm, all the stuff you say in it about screens kind of uh, brainwashing you basically or, or kind of diverting you from real life. I just thought it was it was cool. It was interesting. It was fun, and it was um, also inspiring, and and um, just basically a vehicle for all of your values for your. Yeah, children. exactly. There's um, definitely some moral values in there, but yeah. there's also we try to have just silly, silly yeah. stuff too. You know what I mean? Sure. Just for the kids. It's not all serious by any means. Yeah. And it gives the, the parent an opportunity to decide how far they're going to go. Mm -hmm. Like Dizzy the Unicorn, it's Dizzy Gillespie, you know, famous yep. jazz musician. Mm -hmm. And you know, oh, you know what that's a reference to? Here, listen to this music. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I don't expect them to find Bukowski the bookworm and say, well, hey, son, you should check this out. Yeah. yeah. But mm -hmm. when a child's older, they yeah. have a reference. Like, wow, there was a Bukowski the bookworm. Yeah. And if you're going to have a homeless poet who's basically, well, homeless bookworm poet mm -hmm. because bookworms live in books who's homeless because of digital books there's no more books who's right. it gonna be mm -hmm. it has to be Bukowski you know like mm -hmm. I got Oscar the Bee Oscar Wilde yeah there's a lot of like fun references you know yeah. but yeah no congratulations because I really enjoyed it very much and uh, it's cool thanks yeah. man it's really different than anything I've written yeah, in the past you know what I mean sure. yeah sure. you mentioned that you're working on other projects as well you mentioned this uh, book about your childhood, basically. Is that something that's oh, kind of finished? or? Well, I have a first draft of what turned into a memoir. Basically, after my son was born, a lot of things changed inside of me, emotionally, mentally. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you don't have kids, it's hard to really explain it. But oh, basically, yeah. just mm -hmm. having your whole world turned around, man. I spent, I spent yeah. the first six months calling my mom, just saying, thank you, thank you, I'm so sorry, thank you, thank <laughs> you, you know. And, until my mom said, fuck off, get over it. You're a parent, <laughs> I'm gonna it's your turn. Your <laughs> you know, it's your turn. Leave me alone. But when my uh, son was born, I had this idea that I really wanted to tell him the stories of the guys that influenced me, people in my life, experiences yeah. I had. So I started what I was going to call, and I think this might still be the title of it, I was going to call it Short Stories from the Long Road. And it's basically all little short stories about things that influenced me and how I got from North Carolina to Paris. Mm -hmm. And it begins with me moving to North Carolina. It begins with my dad losing his job. It begins with we basically had nowhere to live. We were living in a small trailer you pull behind to go camping in, like gypsy style. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That used to be a camper that we camped in when we go camping, but then we lost our house. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this as a kid. I just thought we were just on one long camping trip. So it begins with that experience. A laundry mat where I would see like homeless guys coming out of the woods in this trail and then going washing their clothes and and all these like childhood experiences where I didn't know and it's about the magic of my youth and not knowing that we had nothing and wanting to go down that trail and where that trail leads to which is a really dirty place like a trailer park really poor people 
And so it begins with that and about a warning as a child about walking railroad tracks and hobos and not becoming like those men and how I inadvertently become one of those men. I run away from home. I was in and out of jail until yeah. I was 21. Running on the streets in San Francisco. Right? Everything, yeah. man. Hitchhike, cross country. So a lot of stories about hitchhikes, uh, fist fights, mm -hmm. jumping trains, getting off the bus, nearly, right. yeah. nearly freezing to death in the middle of Colorado. And all the guys that marked me that were my buddies, like, you know, Will Daniels, a guy I write about, one of my really good friends who did a lot of traveling with me. There's a piece in there where I talk about Lenny Kirk. We went to California together. So it's basically just all these experiences that lead up to where I am now. And they're all short stories. They're not chapters. It's story one, story two, story three. And when you get to the end, you, you get the parent. And then at the end, this is where I kind of, I mean, I'm still working on it, but I had a first draft. Maybe my daughter was already born, so my daughter was maybe one or two when I had a first draft of it. Okay. So it went. It started with me wanting to tell these stories to my son. I didn't know I was going to have another kid, and then wanting to tell these stories to both my children. So now I have a I have a rough draft, but I don't know if there's there's other things to add to it. But what inadvertently happened as I was writing this thing is it turned into a memoir, and each of the stories became interconnected. So they read like chapters. So it reads like a novel. But okay. you can read each one individually as well. So that was another thing I just started for my son and then my daughter because I wanted them to know those stories. And I'm not ready to show, show it to a publisher yet. But So it's like well advanced but not totally well, finished yet. Well, the thing is, is like a lot of it teeters on like I talk about references from A Room with No Windows. Mm -hmm. I talk about, oh, this character was really based on this guy and here's what really happened. Or my novel that I'm shopping now, which is called Good Morning Captain. I make references to those guys. Like one of the characters in there is like a really good friend of mine. It was really pivotal when my father died. He was really there for me. His name's Brent Hobby. Okay. But he was a kid I grew up skateboarding with, total hellraiser like myself. He later ended up becoming the sheriff of the town I grew up in. There's a character based off, off of him in uh, the novel, Good Morning Captain. There's a character, his name's Buster Hall which is based after Brent Hobby, who really did become the sheriff mm -hmm. of the town. It was a guy who actually bailed me out of jail. It's just, it's just a fun story. It's connecting people. One of my good friends, Joe DeRobio, is a character in that who's actually now dead, too. You know, So the memoir really hinges on me getting that published. So anyone who's reading the memoir will understand the references I'm making, you sure. know what I mean, to other things. So it's there. There's, I mean, I have a lot of projects. It's mostly about time at this point. And this, this stuff with mm -hmm. the kids stuff is taking up a lot of my time because I'm doing everything on my own with the publishing right. cards, you know. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, as I was saying, I'm still sending out submissions for, for a novel now. Right, yeah, yeah. So, which is fun, but yeah. pain in the ass, I'd rather be yeah, writing. Yeah, I'm sure it's long and pretty nerve-wracking. Yeah, at this point too, and having so much published work, you know, the big publishers just... I also refuse to do digital books. I don't want digital books. Right, I yeah. write on paper and I want to be read on paper. I think it's a, an important thing. So that's another thing. Yeah. Like some publishers, you know, they digital books. You don't have to do anything. Yeah, you, you it's know? much costs much less, I guess, for them. Uh, yeah, for sure. But if I wanted to do a digital book, I could set up my own website. At this point, with everything we've done, I think I have an audience. But yeah. I, I want an object. I want a book. I want something that goes on a shelf. Mm -hmm. You know, I want yeah. I want a hit pad. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> a good transition because I wanted to ask you a little bit about, about that about um, basically modern technology and, and like uh, social networks and all that stuff uh, I understand you kind of keep away from all that but not, not necessarily uh, completely away I mean the proof being that we exchange emails you're doing this interview for a podcast you're not completely secluded uh, or isolated from society or whatever but yeah I was just curious well, to uh, ask you a little bit about that So the technology thing, you know, honestly, for me, it's become like a super touchy subject because it's become such a big part of people's lives and it's really yeah. easy to offend them. My thing with the no phone thing, in all honesty, if I boil it down to one answer, why do I not have a phone? Mm -hmm. That one answer is romance. It stole all the romance from my life. When I had the phone, and this is even before internet phones, you know, just texting, people calling you, there's always something else happening. You're never in one place. Here's a quick example. We went on vacation a few years ago with some another family. Their kids are a little bit older than our kids. We were on this beautiful river in this mill house in Italy. 
and Tennessee wanted to go explore the river, wanted to go up the river and explore. And I was like, awesome, let's do it tomorrow. Crystal clear river, it's a beautiful place. Like, yeah, we'll go up the river tomorrow. And uh, all the other kids are like, no, there's nothing up there. And I was like, oh, have you guys gone? They're like, no, we looked down the Google Maps. Okay, so what? They Googled it, looked on the maps and blew it up from Ariel and could see like, it's yeah. just a river. And yeah. I was like, okay, that's cool. Tennessee and I are gonna go. So I took Tennessee up the river the next day, man. We found like a big place to jump in the water and go swimming, really deep water. We had our mask, we saw trout. There was all kinds of snakes everywhere, which was pretty crazy. We found a waterfall, a slide you can go down. I caught a giant bullfrog, like a really big bullfrog. And like mm -hmm. we saw the frog. It was just all day on the river. It was amazing. My son was so happy. It was crazy when we came back home. He couldn't stop talking about all the stuff that yeah. he found. Meanwhile, these kids are like, what? Really? Can you take us there? And I was like, I, was like, I don't know. Can Google take you there? Yeah. So yeah. it just destroys all the romance. Yeah. You know what I mean? The always knowing things, the never questioning things. I say like it cripples your curiosities before you even crawl. Mm -hmm. It's over. So that's more or less about like carrying around internet in your pocket. Yeah. Also, when I say romance, I mean like, you know what? When I was a single man, and I still do this now to be honest, if I'm lost, if I need directions, I look for the most beautiful woman on the street. I ask her for directions. Yeah. You know what I mean? I go sure. in a cafe. Hey, can I use your phone? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I meet people. Mm -hmm. I get lost. Mm -hmm. I have a new experience. Whereas people don't talk to each other anymore. They just yeah, finger bang their phones. It's crazy. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, also I'm like, as a parent, you got to also understand that you're, whether you like it or not, and whether you were a pro skateboarder or not, or whether you wrote a book, you are, you can be a nobody mm -hmm. and you're the hero to your child. And so your child sees everything you do and everything you don't do. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize that this stuff is really handicapping people. They can't yeah. go anywhere and they can't do anything without their phone. My son knows his mom's phone number. He knows all the door codes. He knows our address. He knows all the buses that go to and from our, you know, what lines come here. He knows the metro, how to use the metro. He knows names of every single solitary person in every bar, every cafe, every bookstore, every shop, every place we go in. He's like, and my wife says like, no one even, no one even recognizes her. She says, my wife, like no one recognizes me unless I'm with Tennessee. Because everybody's like, oh, hey, Tennessee, mm -hmm. you know? So I mean, yeah, it's cool. really important yeah. that if you can't navigate your community without the use of a phone, chances are you're handicapped, you know? And for the screen stuff, you have to understand there's absolutely no reason for a child to be on the internet. And then when you look at this, the stuff that's now happening, and I know about all this stuff because I'm really involved in my children in school, you know, like the suicides, the social media bullying, the, yeah. the pornography, dick pics, like all mm -hmm. this stuff. If you don't know this, I'll just tell you, it's, it's pretty neat. The thing that makes you smoke is called dopamine. The thing that right. makes you drink, dopamine. Yeah. The thing that makes you gamble, dopamine mm -hmm. the thing that makes you touch your phone dopamine, dopamine. Yeah. your brain releases dopamine every time you touch that thing yeah every just, time just <laughs> yeah no for sure every time you touch it and people mm -hmm. don't really realize that and there's a there's a simon sinek thing that i like this guy uh, he's a thinker and he does these speeches but there's this thing i like where he says like so basically when you give your 10 year old child a cell phone you're opening up a liquor cabinet and saying have a party and people don't really realize that, you know, mm -hmm. so it's really destructive to people's creative abilities too. you know, that you don't think about anything, you just reference it immediately. Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, the one change that's happened is like five years ago, if I, you know, had to tell somebody five years ago, if I had to ask, like, I'm sorry, could I use your phone? Oh, what? You don't have a phone? Like, no, no, I don't have a phone. And they've taken out all the pay phones now. Yeah. I used to carry a calling card. Yeah. There's no pay phones anywhere. Yeah. So now I occasionally have to ask a person for a phone or go in a cafe. But five years ago, people were what, like, what? You don't have a phone? Like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Like, what's mm -hmm. wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And now when you ask people if you can use their phone and you tell them, if they ask, I don't just announce it. But if you say, no, I don't, I, I don't have a phone, they're like, oh, man, so lucky. And they just hand you their phone. Like, wow, really? That's amazing, you know? Because I think people are starting to really understand that it's actually eating them kind of. And well, I mean, you're, you're talking to someone who's following it and done a lot of research on it mm -hmm. and is really up on this what's happening with uh, technology and social media and all this stuff. And I can tell you, man, it's not looking good at all, mm -hmm. you know? 
when you see kids that have addictions like video games, yeah, addictions yeah. like Instagram, Pornography, when you see yeah. young women that sleep at night with their phone and beep, and they pick it up and start texting, it's yeah, not good, it's man. Messed up, yeah. It's not good. And you know, people don't realize too. People think that the internet is like this giant library, but I mean, you won't go in any library in the world and find trash. Mm-hmm. And the internet is full of trash. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's pretty insane to think that parents let their kids loose on the internet. I mean, there's absolutely no place for a child on the internet. There's nothing for them to see on the internet. It's debatable whether we should be looking at it. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. Real information is printed. It can't be altered. It's Mm -hmm. printed, you know? Not to say that you can't find some good information or that it it works for some things, but the point is, is just as quickly as you can spread a truth, you can spread a lie. Yeah. And the one thing that people don't really realize is that because of the music you listen to online, they know how you feel about gay marriage. Yeah. Because of the recipes you look up online, they know how you feel about animal rights. Right. Because yeah. of the news source you look at online, they know how you're going to vote. If you buy books online or read digital books online, they now know what you're reading. No one should ever know what you're reading. Every single piece of your life is a statistic and someone's selling you something. Yeah. So it's a really dangerous place. And people don't, Mm -hmm. they act like they don't care. And then you end up with a president like Trump. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I have a a last question to come back to skateboarding a little bit, but like when I started this podcast in March, well, the the whole point of the podcast kind of was also to talk about skateboarding as it's evolved, because like, as I said, I started in 2000, so skateboarding was already pretty big at that time. The Tony Hawk Pro Skater games were coming out, but it was, at least in France, it was still somewhat not very popular. Today, it's obviously a much, much different picture and skateboarding has become much more accessible and popular. And uh, especially with the Olympics that just happened this summer. And yeah, I was just interested in what your view is on skateboarding today. Do you still skate every now and then? How involved are you in, in the skateboarding world, whether it's in the US or in France? What kind of connection do you still keep to skateboarding today? And well... I think like to, to like be really honest and I've, I've kind of spoke like this before, but mm-hmm. I kind of feel like my generation, we came from artists and misfits. And I think the generation that you have now has turned into jocks and athletes. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people think that's a negative thing to say. I'm just saying it's changed. Mm-hmm. We were beat up or made fun of for skateboarding. Now you kind of get made fun of if you don't have a skateboard. Yeah. So with that said, skateboarding became really mainstream. So to put another layer on top of that layer, I think that nearly everything that attracted me to skateboarding when I was a kid is gone. If I was a kid now, I don't think I'd be attracted to it. I was a misfit. I was into, you know, crazy things. Punk rock, skateboarding, tattoos. You know what I mean? I was a wild child in, you know, a small farming community. And I really attached myself to that stuff. Would I now? My answer is no. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's bad. Everything has to change or it stagnates. And stagnation is when you rot in yourself. It's the worst thing that can happen. So it's good that it's changed as far as what's my involvement. Now, since my son just recently got got into skateboarding, because I've had such extensive injuries, I can't stand on my right leg, and I'm goofy for it. So I can't skate goofy for it. Yeah, it's your pushing leg. It's your... It's my standing leg, so I can't hold my weight up and bend my knee and push. So... I started skating switch with him, you know, occasionally just showing stuff, which I can switch. I can skate switch. I'm just not a powerhouse. I have no power in switch, Mm. but he skates regular footed. So it's easier for him to see because it's not the opposite. So I cruise around with him a little bit, show him little things, try to be, you know, try to just do dad stuff. You know what I mean? But not every kid has a father that was a pro skateboarder. Yeah. yeah. And it's a little tough sometimes because I think he just wants to see me jump on a thing and do the dance and I can't do it anymore. Yeah. You know, as far as like the the involvement industry wise, I mean, I still have friends in the industry that I speak with, that I do projects with, that I'm involved with. I mean, a good example is Todd Bradford. Yeah. You know, or here in France, man, you know what I mean? Like, I'm always happy to do projects with with Benjamin, whom I see all the time. We've done a couple photo projects together. Mm -hmm. It's strange because the title I have skateboarding is not really skateboarding anymore. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Like, when I talk to those people, it's not really about skateboarding. It's just that we're older skateboarders now doing other projects. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I just saw Kevin Marks when I was in San Francisco, man. I mean, I've known Kevin for probably 25, maybe 30 years, you know? 
Kenny Reed, he saw Kenny. Kenny was living, he's living right down the street from, well, right down the valley from where I was. Okay. I tried to see him. It just didn't work out with family. He's got a, he's got a newborn too. So when I see people, it's like no time passed. I always, I get Howard Cook on the phone. He's a good friend of mine. He's right. in yeah, Great yeah. Britain. And I love to bump into guys. Like I'm going to go to this thing for Ruka right, yeah. on Saturday. And, you know, my buddy Mark Haziza, yeah, who's Mark awesome. Haziza, yeah. I don't see Mark enough anymore, man. Mark's mm-hmm. awesome. But he invited me there. I'm going to see my buddy Roman Parisia, who's a skateboarder too. Yeah. And I'm sure I'm going to see other guys at this event. But most of the guys that I, I talk to, that I see, that I do projects with are, are people that have evolved. You know, we just have a tie from skateboarding and we're doing yeah. other things now. You're you know not I mean? necessarily still pro skaters or involved in the industry. Or... Yeah, I mean, I still know some guys that are still doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, it's pretty crazy, man. I don't see how I don't see how some of these guys are handling it at their age, man. Yeah. Well, I think we can wrap it up here because otherwise I could just keep <laughs> asking you questions forever. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. No, easy, man. Thanks that for getting in really contact cool. with me, man. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. That's it for my conversation with Scott. If you'd like to read Scott's latest book, An Active Imagination, you can order it online at paperweightpublishing.com. If you're ever in Paris, go check out his wife's store, Landline, located at 107 Avenue Parmentier. And if you've never seen it, go watch Pontesalve's first film, The Strongest of the Strange, on YouTube or wherever you like to watch videos. Thank you for tuning in, and see you soon for a new episode of Beyond Boys. <laughs>